Out of the hills of Habersham, down the valleys of Hall, I hurry amain to reach the plain, run the rapid and leap the fall. Split at the rock and together again, accept my bed, or narrow or wide, and flee from folly on every side, with a lover's pain to attain the plain, far from the hills of Habersham, far from the valleys of Hall. In the 19th century, when Sidney Lanier wrote that beautiful song of the Chattahoochee, the river flowed practically its entire length in an idyllic setting. Georgia was rural in those days. Today, near the end of the 20th century, the metropolitan area of Atlanta and other growing cities along its banks take their water from the river and return their municipal waste to the river. We've seen that the river is in trouble and needs our help. The people of Interface, who live in the cities of LaGrange and West Point along its banks, also take their water from the river. Our factories in those cities return their waste to the river. Together we must do a better job. Won't you join the people of Interface in that? And let's preserve and protect the river and its natural wonder and beauty for our children and their children and theirs for generations to come. Thank you. April 1st, 1995. Photographers Monica and Joe Cook set out on an adventure, and some would say a test of their marriage an unlikely canoe trip. It came to them while hiking the Appalachian Trail. Why not discover a place millions of people use and visit, but may not have seen in its entirety? Why not follow the Chattahoochee River from headwaters to the Gulf of Mexico? A lot of people, you know, would you know, raise their eyebrows or you know, shake their heads when we told them about the trip. After 100 days and 163 rolls of film, Joe and Monica had proof that the two-person canoe is not a divorce boat, but the best way to understand the Chattahoochee from the river's point of view. miles south of the Appalachian Trail, the Chattahoochee River bursts over horse trough falls. Here the water flows through mountain forests carpeted by leaves. Banks are lined with wild rhododendron. After hiking on a hot summer day, you probably wouldn't hesitate to take a drink. Only a few more miles downstream, the river leaves U.S. Forest Service land and enters civilization. The Chattahoochee stirs rapids through downtown Helen. Neighboring communities fear Helen will send alpinesque ripples into the historic Saltina Coochie Valley. That's where white settlers pushed out and moved in behind Cherokee families 150 years ago. The Chattahoochee and tributaries like the Soquee River run through farmlands still. But intense interest in this property is building. The land has doubled in value over the last 10 years ever since more city dwellers started building weekend getaways or places for permanent escapes. At the start of their trip, Monica and Joe walked through the river. It was too overgrown and small to paddle. And just north of Helen, they were able to put the canoe in the water and almost immediately test their skills. The signs of civilization came sooner than they expected. So we saw a lot of um construction, you know, and especially along the river. It, we probably didn't have a day that we didn't hear hammers or saws or something in the, in the background. At the same time, the river is still relatively wild and pristine from the headwaters down to uh, Lake Lanier. Yeah. And uh, at Lake Lanier, to us, it seemed like the river just kind of died because it was no longer this undisturbed river. From then on, it was, um, you know, man harnessing the river. Uh, are using the river in some way. Lake Lanier is the deepest of the lakes created by dams on the Chattahoochee. Back in 1950, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers had three purposes in mind for a new lake. The first was to prevent flooding, the driving mission of the Corps back then. Second was to provide a drinking water supply for the growing Atlanta metro area. 
The third use envisioned for the lake was power. Hydropower is still produced here and at other dams on the Chattahoochee, but it accounts for only 2% of the total electricity Georgia Power distributes. Today, Lake Lanier is a recreation resource worth millions of dollars. At the time the Chattahoochee was dammed here, no one really thought a place to play could be so valuable. Downstream of Lake Lanier, the biggest impact of the dam is very cold water sucked off the bottom of the lake. Were it not for the 50 degree water sweeping through, there would be no trout luring sportsmen to the Chattahoochee. And Christopher Scally would have a hard time making a living as a fishing guide. I guess I've been fishing the river since I was five, really, with my older brother. And um, been fly fishing since I was 12, and we just, you know, we didn't read any magazines or anything. It's all hands-on, just, you know, when something like this happens, a cat is hatched, we just said, gosh, we got to figure it out. And we got into fly fishing because of the river, not so much, you know, magazines and shows and stuff like that. A spring caddis fly hatch on the Chattahoochee makes the river look almost like a stream in Montana. Caddis emerge from their larval stages in the water in clouds. So for a couple of weeks in the spring, the trout gorge themselves on the tiny flies. Wait till y'all see the color on this fish. He's just gorgeous. Awesome. Look at the, the red colors. See the red in him and the nice, beautiful fins. I love that part of them here. This, it's, uh, it's like a like a work of art, isn't it? This, this little creature looks like it belongs in this beautiful water. Chris Scally likes to describe the Chattahoochee south of Buford Dam and north of Atlanta as one of the best fly fishing streams in the United States and one of the sport's best kept secrets. There he goes. Oh, decent fish. Yet the trout you would catch here are not native to the Chattahoochee. Though trout probably breed in the river, they don't in large enough numbers to support the fishery. So they are bred and raised in hatcheries and then released in the wild. Anywhere from one third to half of the state's brook, brown and rainbow trout come from the Buford Trout Hatchery. The hatchery raises nearly half a million trout every year, about half of which go into the Chattahoochee. The fish need cold, clear water. 2,000 gallons per minute are pumped from the river to simulate running streams. The hatchery is located in Forsyth County, one of the fastest growing counties in the state. But Bill Couch doesn't have to leave the hatchery to know that. All he has to do is look at the water drawn in after a rainstorm to see evidence of runoff from construction sites and pavement that wasn't there before. Yeah, there's been a tremendous change. There was no rain that would cause us problems 15 years ago. The hardest, the hardest rain events were something we just watched the river cloud a little bit. But n now even small rain events cause us problems. Yeah, the, the river's deteriorating. The sad part about it is we're just not quite within sight of the dam here, um, about a mile, a mile and a half downstream. And this water at some times of the year can be, can be made almost unsuitable for trout. Certainly the water I draw into the hatchery can. Two factors make water unsuitable for trout, warm temperatures and dirt. Dirty water for a fish is like dirty air for us. It stresses the body and warm water causes trout to need more oxygen. So when dirty, warm water enters the hatchery, Bill Couch has to decide which hazard to take on. The measures he takes to settle the silt end up warming the water. Warm up the water too much and the fish die. At the Chattahoochee River Club, a 630 home development on 700 acres bordering the Buford Trout Hatchery Lakes were installed to hold rainwater running off the property. And in a concession to pressure from environmental groups and the hatchery, the developer put in a system to withdraw water from the bottom of the lakes where the water should be cooler. Developer Don Donnelly knew he would have more hurdles to clear before building on the river, 
but he hadn't anticipated spending two years negotiating with environmentalists. The Chattahoochee River Club, as originally planned, would have cut between two parcels of National Park Service land. Donnelly's development had a mile on the riverfront. We uh, gave up 200 feet of river frontage, which uh, was we couldn't build on anyway. So I think our people, our homeowners, will still be able to use the riverfront. Now it's national park land. Uh, they won't actually own it, but they're going to still be able to use it. In exchange for the riverfront, the Chattahoochee River Club was given other land owned by the National Park Service. To environmentalists, the deal wasn't perfect. Well, what's not perfect is that if we had all the money that we would wish that we would have had, we could have paid the $10 million, bought all of the land, and the subdivision wouldn't be there at all. That's not real in, in today's economy, and, uh, and it's, it's not real that we're going to stop development. So what we need to do is find partnerships with developers who see that preserving natural resources actually enhance the value of their communities. Rand Wentworth is the Atlanta director for the Trust for Public Land. The trust wants to preserve a green corridor along the Chattahoochee. The primary target? The area north of Atlanta and south of Buford Dam, which happens to run through three fast-growing and prosperous counties, Forsyth, Gwinnett, and Fulton. We're tracking every property from Lake Lanier right to the city. We know exactly where they're going, and there's three years left what natural lands are left, and there's some beautiful ones left on the river, but they'll all be developed in the next three years. So our staff, which is real estate attorneys and former developers like me, are there negotiating with landowners and offering tax incentives and using tax laws and estate planning to help secure properties before it's too late. The trust often has to compete against developers with deep pockets. North of Atlanta, golf course communities seem to line the river. Joe and Monica took to counting golf balls and basketballs on their trip down. Morgan Falls Dam built in 1905, generated electricity for the streetcars in downtown Atlanta. From here, the National Park Service will have a new 80-acre park stretching from here downriver. It's one of the trust for a public land successes. Now protected, the power farm's 150-year-old cabin sits high above the Chattahoochee. That's what they used to do, build away from the water and the likelihood of flooding. And I think uh, before you're born and raised on the farm and work the land, I think you think more of the land and that people ain't farmed and work. J.C. Hyde has watched his East Cobb County property skyrocket in value. Go a short distance from Hyde Road and you'll see large expensive houses in either direction. But J.C. Hyde has other wishes for his property. I'd like to stay on just like this and it would never be cut up, tore up in houses, built and it, all the woods done away with. And I'd like to see all the woods stay on just like they are, not, not blow those up. One of the arguments for preserving land along the Chattahoochee is that it creates a natural wooded buffer between where people live and the river. The buffer can filter out the stuff we put on our lawns, stop the silt that washes off places where we dig, and contain pollutants coming from the roads. These pollutants have another way to get into the Chattahoochee. They flow virtually unchecked into the river from hundreds of miles of creeks that thread through the watershed. They have names like Flat Shoals, Hogwaller, and Sweetwater. They're big, level, and tall. Some have no names at all. A few seem nearly as wide as the Chattahoochee itself. They contribute to the water we drink, set a feast for our eyes, and few are as protected as the river they feed. 
When you're on the Chattahoochee, you might notice a ribbon of brown, especially when the river itself is clear and green. This is John's Creek a day after rain. Unlike the other creeks on the river that day, it runs brown. And this is the river just downstream from Level Creek two months earlier. Along Level Creek, a contractor working for Gwinnett County clears land for a new sewer line and pump station. Earth moving equipment crossed the creek, sending silt downstream. The greatest danger to creeks and to the watershed is land disturbing activities that lead to erosion, whether it's tearing out plants and trees along the banks or lack of fences to hold dirt. Local governments, overseen by state authorities and boards, are largely responsible for enforcing state laws on erosion control. When faced with the pressure to develop and the desire to increase tax base, few local governments want to stand in the way of development. Even the fastest growing counties have at most a few people to enforce the law. So what's your job like if you're the chief soil and erosion inspector in, say, Fulton County? It's like, it's like dropping a, a, a bucket of golf balls on a driveway and trying to pick them all up before they roll to the street. I guess it's tantamount to that. Nowadays, Donald Mitchell spends nearly all of his time in North Fulton County. His job is part cop, part educator. The educator part is important. Because there's no rules in Georgia that can prevent a builder from flipping hamburgers at a Waffle House tonight and building a $250,000 house, $1, house tomorrow. All you got to do is have the money it requires to get the license and go in and get them and start clearing and grading and grubbing and destroying the creeks and the brooks and the natural habitats that exist here in the state. Some of the best management measures do seem to help, but in a heavy rain, dirt finds a way around. This office complex is being built in Alpharetta. The stream receiving a lot of Alpharetta stormwater is Big Creek, a major tributary to the Chattahoochee. Big Creek runs next to Georgia 400, so it receives runoff from the hottest growth area in the state. Dee West is the Environmental Services Director for Alpharetta, and her staff and volunteers are assembling a database for Big Creek. They're looking at water quality and what organisms still live here. One thing she knows already, the large fish are gone, and the creek often looks muddy. We've been told by the State Soil and Water Conservation District uh, and the Commission that Alpharetta does a pretty good job of erosion control. But all it takes is one or two or three incidences, and you've got this, you know? Um, plus, everything that comes from above us comes to us. We add to it, and we pass it on to someone else. So it's very hard to say distinctly, this much is Alpharetta's, and this much can't. That's a waste of time. We all contribute to the problem. And as long as we're all trying to improve the situation through whatever mechanisms we determine would be most appropriate, I think that that's what's important in watershed management, You know, that we just don't sit on our thumbs and say, they created this problem. You know, we created this problem, all of us. Big Creek meanders to the city of Roswell and the town's water intake. It's a small water treatment plant by city standards, serving 10,000 customers. But ensuring those customers have clean water has proved costly. Sediment from Big Creek carries contaminants and sometimes fine silt floats into parts of the plant where it shouldn't go. It's just very difficult to control, make a safe operation. So. Uh, now, don't get me wrong now, if it's not safe, we shut it down. I just shut it down. but. But uh, it's just, you can see it's, it's getting, we're getting behind the eight ball here on this one, you know, and, and uh, very few laws that really protect it, that I see it. If they're, if they're there, they're not being enforced. So thousands of dollars go to operating a temporary dredge, which is attempting to clear sediment from the water intake. Not too far from where Big Creek meets the Chattahoochee lies Soap Creek. As it tumbles through national parkland, it goes past an old road leading to the ruins of a paper mill. U.S. Geological Survey biologist Carol Couch is searching a little creek nearby that feeds Soap Creek. There are two very large 
individuals here that look like big maggots. Well, in fact, that's what they are. <laughs> These are um, crane fly larvae. And uh, they make their living by um, eating and consuming the dead leaf materials that are, that are here in the, in the creek. Carol Couch uncovers a diverse population of fly larvae, the food of a diverse species of bigger creatures like fish. This little stream originates and ends on protected national park land. No development, no pavement nearby. Each time she dips her net in the stream, Couch finds tiny creatures like newly hatched salamanders and larvae that can only exist in very clean, cold water. Couch says you won't find stone fly larvae in most urban creeks because the stormwater runoff makes creeks too warm and polluted for them to survive. Next, Couch checks Soap Creek, steps away from where the little tributary flows into it. Here, the bigger stream looks pristine, but a quick check seems to prove otherwise. Soap Creek has lots of sand and few, if any, insect larvae. Upstream, homes line the banks of the creek. Sides show signs of erosion, which also contributes sediment to the stream. The U.S. Geological Survey scientists know this part of the creek well. Over the, the course of three years, visiting this, this stream in both the spring and the fall, I have yet to collect um, one stone fly from this stretch of, of, uh, of Soap Creek. Uh, I, I think that that in of itself is, is, is fairly indicative of many of the problems that this, this creek faces as far as alteration of both the flow of water, the inputs of sediment, uh, the potential runoff from storms that carries with it a variety of, of, of chemicals and metals that run off from our pavement, our concrete, our roadways, and our airports. It's a stream that has, compared to what it should have, uh, a very low diversity and abundance of both fish as well as invertebrates. Pollution flowing off the land affects the aquatic life in Soap Creek and others. It's not just a threat to the Chattahoochee's nearly 50 tributaries, but to the river as well. Most of the regulations on clean water govern what comes out of pipes from big polluters. There's no direct enforcement on the little guys. In other words, us. When you have uh, eight or ten sewage treatment plants and only four or five local governments that, that you're dealing with on the biggest sources of pollution, that's fairly straightforward. When you've got a million people that we've got to educate uh, in lots of different ways uh, to be kinder and gentler to the river, that's, a, that's another issue. And uh, getting people to realize that, that all of us have an individual responsibility and all of us can have an impact uh, on these creeks and, and, uh, uh, and rivers is uh, uh, something that we haven't uh, done a great job of yet. Need to do a lot more. I am so tired of hearing the government say that non-point source pollution, the, the flow off the land is our problem. They've been saying that for a decade, but they have not been trying to do anything about it. Only last year did citizens actually try to get funding and secure funding for some real good studies that are going to help us know better how to keep dirt on the land when there's a development and out of the creeks. The government has taken no proactive role in finding those solutions, practical solutions. Environmentalist Sally Bethay is the upper Chattahoochee River keeper. Mm -hmm. She keeps an eye on the river from headwaters to West Point Lake. Bethay believes public pressure and practical solutions can help clean up the river. Both approaches worked on Matthews Asphalt Company, which at one time had huge banks of asphalt piled on the edge of the Chattahoochee. River keeper convinced the company to move the asphalt back and plant sod, all of which cost money Matthews hadn't planned to spend.
Millions of gallons every week flow through municipal wastewater treatment plants and back into the Chattahoochee. This is the city of Atlanta's R.M. Clayton Wastewater Treatment Plant, the largest in the southeast. Parts of the plant date back to the 1930s. As water quality standards increased, treatment steps were added to the old structure. For example, now microorganisms eat bacteria too small to be strained out in earlier processes. The water is chemically treated and sent back to the river. That's the way the system is supposed to work. The city of Atlanta now has to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to upgrade R.M. Clayton so that it can handle the flow of stormwater. Before the upgrade, untreated sewage goes into the river up to 50 times a year. Sewage also can get into the river through the antiquated combined storm and sewage overflows called CSOs. Now it's illegal to send untreated sewage to creeks. The city of Atlanta also spends hundreds of millions of dollars to build many treatment plants for the CSOs. But despite all the technology and the millions spent, a nagging problem remains. Due to the stresses that we put on the Chattahoochee in the metropolitan Atlanta area, uh, there are a lot of miles in, in the Chattahoochee that don't meet uh, our water quality standards uh, all of the time. The, the biggest problem we have is bacteria, um, and, and that, that bacteria doesn't uh, necessarily come from sewage treatment plants. Uh, the sewage treatment plants disinfect their effluents, kill the bacteria before they discharge into the rivers and the creeks, but uh, uh, the bacteria are coming from other places, and, and uh, uh, that seems to have been our biggest problem. In fact, a state study shows that around 60% of the streams that feed the Chattahoochee do not completely meet standards for their uses, which include fishing and swimming. That same study of water quality issued by Georgia's Environmental Protection Division shows how input from these streams can concentrate in the Chattahoochee. The river from the mountain-born Soakley River south to Columbus is not suitable for any of its uses. High bacteria levels are especially worrisome because the tests for fecal coliform bacteria tell only part of the story. Scientists assume that where there are high fecal coliform counts, there are high levels of other bacteria, potentially more hazardous to human health. Another problem, the most urbanized streams contribute high levels of lead and other heavy metals linked to cancer. Sometimes pollution is easy to see if not identify. Volunteers with the Upper Chattahoochee River Keeper are helping people living near Proctor Creek clean the stream. Proctor Creek has changed a lot since Arlen Weathersby was a child. We used to come down here and play in the creek. We used to find all the critters in the creek, uh, see nature at its best, I guess you would say. The uh, creek backs up to a lot of the homes in the community and to the school, so we were able to come down and conduct experiments right out of the classroom, something that many schools were not able to do. The native species along this stretch, maybe a couple of miles down, maybe three miles down, you don't see any life in this creek. Cleaning up Proctor Creek isn't as simple as pulling out trash and hauling it away on a sunny morning. People have long regarded the creek as an ideal spot to dump everything from carpet to tires. The creek runs by a landfill suspected of leaking pollutants, and Proctor Creek receives huge volumes of stormwater running from the city through two CSOs. Arnold Weathersby is taking on the forces arrayed against Proctor Creek and the neighborhood of Carver Hills, one stream bank at a time. At the support of Nature Preserve, he's helping to recreate the outdoor classroom of his youth for other children who dream of camping and hiking in the woods. I was really kind of surprised with how peaceful and really pretty it is south of Atlanta. That is the dirtiest stretch, but it's also a very beautiful stretch of river in, in the sort of wide, lazy river kind of aspect, you know. Um, we saw a ton of beavers there and, and hawks and stuff like that. In fact, that was the first place that you didn't have houses lining the banks of the river. Because nobody wants to 
live next to a smelly river. So you don't see any houses. Um, you don't see the development you do north of Atlanta. And it's, uh, you know, you see green, you know, walls of green on the sides of the river. About halfway down the river between Atlanta and Franklin, the river has a chance to run through countryside again. History lives there too. The Chattahoochee's tributaries were once important sources of power. Sweetwater Creek shows you why. On the banks of the creek sit the ruins of a five-story textile mill. Over a period of 15 years, workers produced tons of basic versatile cloth in the huge state-of-the-art factory. It was the heart of the town of New Manchester and a magnet for destruction. In 1864, northern troops burned the mill and sent the men, women, and children of New Manchester to Indiana. A few years later, some families returned, but no one had the heart or the money to rebuild. Farther down river, you can take in the lazier character of the Chattahoochee standing atop a bluff at McIntosh Reserve. In 1825, Chief William McIntosh part Creek, part White, signed a treaty ceding Creek land south of here to settlers. Now, he knew that doing so violated Creek law for which the penalty was death, but he thought U.S. soldiers would protect him. Together with the men of his family, Chief McIntosh was executed near this peaceful spot, his reward for signing the treaty. The town of Franklin with its historic jail sits above the Chattahoochee, just south of Franklin lies the headwaters of West Point Lake. When you got to the top of the lake there, you really saw kind of scummy water and trash and stuff that was just standing in the water, really backed up there, you know. And, uh, so that was disappointing to see because on the flowing river, I'd almost kind of decided, well, it's not really that bad. But then you get to the top of Lake West Point and it's, you know, it's bad. And there was, you know, there were was trash along the edges of the river, but because it's a flowing body of water, it doesn't show the damage. Some people see a lot of potential in West Point Lake. It's a great lake. It, uh, we have a perception problem that uh, is a gigantic part of why we just want it fixed in Atlanta. Although our water's better until it, the front of the Atlanta Constitution says, the deal is done, the facilities are finished, people aren't going to believe that. Of all the lakes on the Chattahoochee, this one has been linked with pollution in people's minds. In fact, it was too much of a naturally occurring substance that made headlines, phosphorus. It's found in food weed and other organic matter. In the late 1980s, phosphorus flowed into West Point Lake and stayed there, causing an overgrowth of algae, which in turn hurt the fish population. After high phosphate detergents were banned and treatment improved somewhat, the water seemed to be getting better. But it seemed to Steve Langford that the state was allowing the city of Atlanta to pay fines rather than comply with laws requiring construction of new wastewater facilities. Angered, he convinced colleagues in the state legislature to greatly increase the fines. The uh, penalties were raised from $8,000 a day to $20,000 a day. But the decision had been made years before to change the plan from its original uh, concept to its, to its current concept. Uh, I'm not sure what impact it had other than it was clearly punitive to the city of Atlanta and increased the penalties without allowing us any ability to respond in any other way. The only way to do it was with fines that were uncomfortable enough. Now, interestingly enough, although they say that, it's, uh, that they didn't enhance the schedule, for the first time it looks like these facilities are going to be completed on time. So it was the only way. They have no desire to punish the city of Atlanta. Langford and the West Point Lake Development Authority he serves on is spending time and thousands of dollars trying to clean up the lake's image, beginning with a study measuring fecal coliform bacteria levels. At this point, they can only hope for a clean bill of health and for the boats to fill marina slips again. This stretch of the Chattahoochee tributary, known as Mulberry Creek, shows us the power and the beauty of the fall line, the point where the land elevation suddenly drops. Like this creek, the Chattahoochee also tumbles down what must have been very challenging whitewater rapids before the dams were built. 
Between West Point Lake and Columbus, there are nine dams, most no more than one mile apart. A canoeing guidebook calls this stretch a paddling trip suitable only for bad dreams. And here's the nightmare, open spillways, calm water above, churning and deadly below. Joe and Monica know that at a certain point, they won't be able to keep from going over. They also know that there are better places than others to take the canoe out and carry it. This unglamorous part of canoeing doesn't really require finesse or special expertise. Just put an awkward 65 pound weight on your shoulders and watch your step. On this day, Joe and Monica portage around one dam. Two years before, they carried around four dams in one day, their most grueling of the trip. When we got here, we were darn happy. <laughs> yeah. We pulled up to this boat ramp, and we were <laughs> awfully happy to be here, because we knew that we, we wouldn't have to get happened. out and carry our canoe anymore. It was hot, and we were sick, and gosh, it was hard carrying around all those dams. So we were, <laughs> so we were very, very happy to see this little boat ramp right here. <laughs> Just steps away from the boat ramp is Columbus's River Walk. A paved trail follows the river from the last dam to Fort Benning, 10 miles. People launch boats from it, ride bikes, jog. Um, Peggy Theus of the Columbus Chamber of Commerce had a dream to transform Columbus's riverfront. At one time, it was a difficult dream to take seriously. The river had become our back door. People dumped trash. It was, it was full of debris. And so people would just laugh. But we were able to get on, on programs at civic groups, and the state had mandated we clean up the CSO, the combined sewer overflow problem. And Billy Turner, the president of the Waterworks, was sitting in the audience at one of those presentations. We were looking at different places to put the sewer. And All we had to show were slides of what other cities across the United States had done, beautiful examples of how they had river walks and, and development along harbors and rivers. And then I would show those, and the last few slides I would show our river, our river and how bad it looked. And, and um, it really took people back a little bit. The Columbus Waterworks put $9 million into the initial phase of the river walk with a new CSO interceptor line running underneath. More private money and support from taxpayers helped complete the project. I, mean, I think a lot of people wanted to do something, but it really was the combined sewer program that allowed us to uh, develop the riverfront. And now uh, so many things have happened along the riverfront with the uh, upgrade of the old baseball park to be the Olympic Stadium last year and the Olympic Complex and the Civic Center. And the list of Riverwalk development goes on. It even spills over to Phoenix City, Alabama. Thanks to water and sewer improvements, Columbus no longer violates federal water quality standards, and large fish like bass are thriving. Everything good to do. He's gonna load in the cooler, take them on with him. Then we're gonna we catch another one, bass in about 30 minutes. But say you study water habitats, would you still eat the fish? I have, but I live dangerously sometimes. Uh, you probably don't want to eat a lot of fish out of some areas of the river. The little bit of monitoring they do in some of the reservoirs to the north of Columbus, some fish have showed up with unacceptable materials in their, in their flesh. There's an element of risk, but probably not as great as the risk I took when I drove down here this morning. While some animals make a comeback, other pieces of the Chattahoochee's natural puzzle are missing, like the large freshwater mussels that fed an entire civilization of native people whose pottery lies everywhere along the river. These days, a live mussel would be all but impossible to find. You know, nobody really takes a mussel home at night to cuddle with it, so people don't get as excited about mussels disappearing, but it's certainly a part of the legacy that's gone. Uh, people care about fish because they like to fish for them, and if, if bass were being impacted, we'd hear about it. But bass are probably 
more abundant and growing larger in the river than they would have been 100, 200 years ago. feel like we ended up having more scenic stuff like when we were putting our slide program together I wish that we had more pictures of the of the trash that we saw our, our inclination wasn't to take pictures of the bad stuff you know it, it was almost like we had like a lot of times we would say oh wait we need to get a picture of that you know we need to stop and take a picture of that stuffed animal hanging in a tree or that you know <laughs> or that huge flotilla of plastic and you know all kinds of trash you know um, did you feel that way? Yeah, that but you're, to... you're drawn to the beauty. You're not, yeah. uh, you know, nobody wants to see trash. We worked with several organizations that were working to protect the river, and so we kind of had the goal of bringing some awareness to the river, you know, uh, giving the river something of a, uh, I don't know, a little PR campaign <laughs> to an extent, because we, you know, tried to talk to a lot of people in towns and stuff like that. Joe and Monica found beauty and character in the people who live in river towns. These portraits are of a handful of the millions who depend on the Chattahoochee. Economic ties as well as emotional ones bind people to the Chattahoochee as it nears the Florida state line. In 1963, the river was dammed to form Lake Walter F. George, or if you live in Alabama, Lake Eufaula. Enough hydropower is generated here to serve a city with a population of 40,000. The huge lock allows barges to continue on to Columbus. Barges come through about twice a week. When the weather turns warmer, the lock lifts pleasure boats. There are some who remember what the land was like before the dams were built. Jack Wingate is one of them. He spent his youth hunting the swampy land for arrowheads and looking for old forts. Tall Indian mounds are now under several feet of water. Lost is evidence of an ancient crossroads where the Chattahoochee and Flint rivers meet. Just an interesting place. Uh, we couldn't, you couldn't build dams. You can't build dams now that cover up a place like this. It's very important, they say. Jim Woodruff Dam was completed in 1957, flooding the fork of the Chattahoochee and the Flint. Lake Seminole is very shallow and warm. The freshwater springs and old stands of flooded trees allow all sorts of wildlife to thrive here, from osprey to bass. Jack Wingate runs Wingate's fish camp. His livelihood has been guiding sportsmen. His love is the lake and its history. To him, every stream that feeds Lake Seminole has its own character, its own smell. There's an odor here on the Chattahoochee River that, uh, that is here continuously. Uh, diesel, maybe, uh, sour onions, uh, dill pickle, mixture of all of it together, but definitely a diesel smell in it. And if you'll uh, mess with it and churn the bottom just a little bit, there'll be a, a pine odor, a pine tar odor come out of it. Lake Seminole has the perfect conditions for several species of plants, and a few are capable of covering the lake in green. Every year, the Corps of Engineers spends three quarters of a million dollars on herbicides to kill exotic plants, particularly hydrilla. A plant used in aquariums, hydrilla reproduces rapidly in the wild. It's not in evidence much in early spring, but come fall, the lake will be full of it. It tends to fill the water column with plant material. Uh, it keeps people from getting boats through it. Uh, it clog generally clogs the waterway. And uh, we have also noticed that it gives the uh, uh, water-dissolved oxygen difficulties uh, which has impacts on uh, uh, on fish communities and other aquatic uh, life in the reservoir. Bruce says the Corps knows a cheap and effective way to kill hydrilla, and it's experimenting with this possible solution behind these gates. 
We know that grass carp will eat uh, hydrilla and will control hydrilla. Uh, and we are doing a study as part of the hydrilla action plan study um, using grass carp in certain uh, areas of Lake Seminole where we're trying to uh, keep those grass carp contained within certain smaller areas. Um, and they are doing what we expected them to do. Uh, they will uh, reduce the hydrilla and, and will control it. Uh, the concern with grass carp in Lake Seminole is that if we were to release them in an uncontrolled way in Lake Seminole, there is concern that they would escape downstream and damage the uh, Apalachicola estuarine environment, which is a very valuable uh, environment that, that no one wishes to damage. The concern for Apalachicola Bay is warranted since just beyond the last dam on the system is 106 miles of uncontrolled waterway where the river returns to a relatively wild state. If you stand atop Allen Bluff, the river plain spreads before you. The bluffs and some of the land around them are preserved by the Nature Conservancy. The private property across the river is unused for now, while the timber on it is too cheap to cut down. This is the Apalachicola River, the longest river in Florida. It is the Apalachicola, but it's not really opposed to the Chattahoochee. They are the same river. And that's a mindset that those of us that live in the basin um, need to face. If you stand in Georgia and look down, the mindset is a defensible one. There's the Chattahoochee, there's the Flint, and somewhere down there is one called the Apalachicola. If you stand in Apalachicola and look up from a functional perspective, you get a, a better view. There's only one river. The one river concept is on Woody Miley's mind a lot these days. He studies the Apalachicola system, trying to determine how much fresh water flows from the river to the bay and when. Hundreds of fish and shellfish species spend early stages of life in the Apalachicola Bay, feeding on the rich nutrients that wash in during floods. In times of drought, more salt water flows in, creating a better environment for most predators of oysters, as well as diseases and parasites. But drought is also when farmers upstream require more water, which could increase the severity of drought here. Now that Georgia, Alabama, and Florida have to agree on how much water flows in from the Chattahoochee to state lines, Woody Miley and others are trying to make a strong case for the health of the estuary. For someone like me, just the biodiversity uh, would make it important enough. But we tend to gauge everything based on economics. So we try to use the economics of the seafood industry uh, to help us in protecting the bay. And our seafood industry is a 14 to $16 million dock side value to the folks that are actually catching it. And if you use a multiplier effect, then at the consumer level, our seafood industry is a 70 to 80 million dollar a year industry. And that's impressive, but um, on a relative basis, it's not all that impressive. And it doesn't come close to telling the story of the importance of Apalachicola Bay. Uh, in the open Gulf of Mexico, 95% of all species harvested commercially and 85% of all species harvested recreationally have to spend a portion of their life cycle in a nesterine system. Science has been working on this for 30 years, and nobody's really broke, made a breakthrough on exactly how much water an estuary needs. All we know is that when a certain point is reached, the bottom falls out of the productivity, the estuary changes, oysters are gone, shrimp are gone, fish are gone, uh, the system collapses and changes into a new system that's a lot less productive. This one is still working. It's still a major alluvial river-dominated estuary. It is still unpolluted to a large degree. 
and it still has high, very high productivity. From an oysterman's point of view, Apalachicola Bay still produces a living. Though he's worked as a radio station engineer, Ken Folsom prefers the physical and mental challenges of oystering. I'd probably be one of the last generation of people that do it, but I just love it too much. I, I make just as good or better money than I could. I don't, you can never get rich oystering, but you can make a living at oystering. And there's no other business left in America where you have no employees, you're basically free to work when you want, uh, devoid of state regulations, of course. <laughs> I get to work in a national wildlife refuge all day. There's no people, there's nothing but dolphins and birds and eagles, and, and it's one of the most beautiful places on the face of the planet. Oysters are like gold or like oil. It's a natural resource. It takes money, take me 10 or 15, 20 dollars a day that it turns into 200 dollars and you multiply that times a thousand oystermen and that, that, that uh, say 15 or 20 dollar bag turns into 150 dollars by the time it goes to the restaurants. In other words, like gold or oil, I create jobs. Beyond jobs, the Apalachicola River estuary has value as a virtual catalog of all the different types of wildlife that exist in the absence of large-scale human impact. This ecosystem has the highest density of amphibians and reptiles in North America, north of Mexico. Birds and higher plants live here in great variety, but Woody Miley fears we may not be any better at protecting the Apalachicola system today than we were decades ago. He likens the ecosystem to a pie that previous generations have already sampled. Previous generations have altered the river, developed the land. We weren't part of the last piece, so in our mind's eye, we're looking at a whole pie. The circumference of the pie is reduced, but we don't notice it. We're looking at what's left as the whole pie and go through the same well-intentioned mental process and take another small piece. To take the analogy back to the environment, when the circumference of that pie gets sufficiently reduced that we lose the functional relationships, we just lost that system, we just lost that pie through totally good in intentions. And to the victim, it doesn't matter whether it was manslaughter or murder one, not to the victim, we still lost it. July 10, 1995. After 100 days on the river, Joe and Monica Cook paddle in salt water. Their last challenge is to cross Apalachicola Bay. Then they have to carry the canoe one last time, this time accompanied by family and friends. They measured their journey in pounds of trail mix, 32, steno pads for notes, 11, bottles of sunblock, 4. Their 540 mile trip lives on through photographs. The river's life permeates nearly every corner of our life. It's about every slideshow we'll do, somebody will come up to us afterwards and say, you know, I really love that river. I mean, they'll, haven't you, I mean, there's a lot of older folks that, you know, will see a slideshow. And, They'll come up to us and it'll remind them of experiences they had uh, growing up. Or their family would go down to the river and picnic or fish. And they'll say, you know, I really love that river. And most people can't tell you exactly why they love the river and what makes them love the river, love the river so much. But, uh, you know, they do. It's, uh, it's really a, uh, a spiritual thing and sometimes you're not even aware of it. And we also, a lot of times we'll, when we do slide programs now, we meet people that say, you know, I've always wanted to do that trip. Yeah, that's what I'm I've always saying. wanted to do that trip. Always people always, uh, you know, we've had dozens of people come up to us after a program and say, you know, I've always wanted to do that trip. So what do you say? 
do it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. that, was, that was part of one, one of the things that we thought, you know, would come out of it, is that more people would, would sort of grasp on the idea of actually doing it, you know, because yeah. it is a great way to, to really understand the watershed and understand um, our connection to the river and, and, you know, I mean, there's no better way to, to learn your connection to the river than to actually get out there and travel for any distance on it, you know, and to really see what's going on along it. And also see a bunch of beautiful things, too. Yeah. There's all sorts so. of beauty out there. Mm -hmm. Five.